Hi guys, it's me, Professor Dean, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be going over esophageal and gastric disorders. Now, before I get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. So go ahead and press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I'm now offering a next generation NCLEX reviews and one-on-one -on -one tutoring sessions and consultation sessions. You can reserve your spot right now by going to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons that I have available. Also, almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So please be sure to check me out there as well. Before we get started, I'd like to start off with a prayer. If you're not into that, just go ahead and fast forward. And if you are and not operating heavy machinery and not driving, close your eyes and bow your heads. Father God, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your favor. Thank you for the breath of life in our bodies. Thank you for another opportunity to go over nursing content. Father God, thank you for blessing me with this gift to be able to um, explain information in a way that students are able to comprehend. Thank you for that, Father God. Lord, I pray for every single listener, every single viewer, for whatever reason they came to this channel. I ask that you please uh, help them with whatever they're struggling with. Help them to be able to grasp the information, Father God. Help them to be able to think critically, Lord. When they're taking their quiz, their exam, the NCLEX, Father God, help them to choose the correct answers. Help them to be a safe nurse, Father God. Once they're licensed, let them not forget, Jesus. I ask that you please allow them to be a blessing to others. And Lord, every single viewer, every single listener, Father God, I ask that you please help them to be also grateful to people who are supporting them and loving them through this process, through this journey. I ask that you please bless them as well. Father God, thank you for all that you've done for us in our lives and thank you for all that you will continue to do. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys, let's get started. First question. A 60-year-old client who's been experiencing difficulty swallowing is scheduled for an esophagoscopy. I said the word. I'm proud of myself. All right. What statement uh, to the nurse indicates the client understands the preparation before an esophagoscopy? One, I need to eat a light breakfast before the examination. Two, I should consume a low residue diet until the test has been completed. Three, I need to avoid food and fluids after midnight before the test. Four, I have to drink a quart of liquid before arriving for the test. What do you think the answer is? And the correct answer is three. I need to avoid food and fluids after midnight before the test. Uh, this patient needs to be NPO. Why? Because we want to decrease the chances of aspiration, okay? So this is a tube with a camera that's gonna be going through the mouth down the esophagus. So after midnight, that patient needs to be NPO. We want to decrease the chance of any aspiration. So there's not gonna be light breakfast. There's not gonna be low residue. There's not gonna be a, um, drinking. NPO, no food or drinks after midnight. Next question. The esophagoscopy reveals that the client has a stricture near the end of the esophagus. To help improve the client's ability to swallow, what nursing recommendation is most appropriate? One, eat a variety of foods containing a thickener. Two, thoroughly chew everything that's eaten. Three, avoid drinking beverages while eating a meal. Or four, consume small full liquid, fluid, uh, full liquid foods frequently. And the correct answer is two, thoroughly chew everything that's eaten. So go back to the question. What the question is asking us is what are we going to teach the patient that um, we want to make it easier for them to swallow? It's going to be for them to chew everything that's, eat, uh, that's eaten. Remember, the problem with this patient is they've got a stricture. So there's what? A narrowing. Look at the wrong choices. One, eat a variety of foods containing a thickener. That's not necessary. Choice three, avoid drinking uh, while eating a meal. Actually, because of that stricture, um, drinking will actually help to thin that bolus. So that's wrong. And then choice four, consume small, full liquid foods frequently. That's not necessary. So the correct answer is to truly, um, um, thoroughly chew everything that's eaten so that that food can easily get past that stricture that the patient has. A 38-year-old client admitted with bleeding esophageal varices and will require a blood transfusion. As the nurse reviews the client's medical record, what factor is most likely related to the client's present condition? Is it one, 
there was a prior suicide attempt with poison. Two, the client's been treated for peptic ulcer disease. Three, client appears to be rather malnourished. Four, there's a history of chronic alcohol consumption. And the correct answer is four. Whenever you're thinking of esophageal varices, number one, you need to be thinking about bleeding. You're concerned about bleeding, right? But two, you need to be thinking about risk factors, like number one risk factor, alcohol. Absolutely, that is a huge risk factor. Um, poison, peptic ulcers, being malnourished, none of those are risk factors for esophageal varices. By the, by the way, esophageal varices, that's when the patient has like uh, dilated, twisted uh, veins in the esophagus. Okay, and they're uh, very prone to bleeding. So when you're thinking of esophageal varices, I want you to, again, think of bleeding, but of course think of one of the biggest risk factors, which is alcohol consumption. The registered nurse RN starts an infusion of whole blood and asks the licensed nurse practitioner to continue monitoring the client during the blood transfusion. According to the Joint Commission's National Patient Safety Goals, what nursing action regarding blood administration is most appropriate? One, two nurses must review the blood bag and clients are embraced before administration. Two, a cortical steroid should be available in the vet that the client has a transfusion reaction. Three, an IV line using a 22 gauge needle should be started before administration. Or four, each unit of blood should be completed within six hours of starting it. And guys, the correct answer is number one. Two nurses must review the blood bag at the um, and the client's arm bracelet before administration. And you're going to do that at the bedside. Not at the nurse's station, not anywhere, right there at the bedside. Let's look at the wrong choices. Two, a corticosteroid should be available in the vet that the client has a transfusion reaction. No, what you need to make sure is available at the bed in, in case there's a transfusion reaction is going to be epinephrine. That's what you're going to need. Choice three, uh, excuse me, yeah, choice three, an IV line using a 22 gauge needle should be started before administration. That 22 gauge needle is too small for blood, okay? What you're going to need is something between an 18 and a 20. So that's incorrect. And then choice four, each unit of blood should be completed within six hours of starting it. Six hours is too long. That's allowing enough time for bacteria to start to grow because remember, bacteria loves wet, moist, dark environments. So uh, six hours is too long. So actually it's gonna be four hours. So that's incorrect. So that number one is a correct answer choice. As the licensed practical nurse is monitoring the client receiving blood transfusion, what assessment finding is the best indication of a transfusion reaction? One, the client's urine is very dark yellow. Two, the client suddenly becomes dyspneic. Three, the client's skin is pale and cool. Or four, the client experiences extreme thirst. We're talking about a transfusion reaction. So the correct answer is going to be two. The client suddenly, and that should have been a clue to you. Let me tell you guys something. When you are looking at these test questions and you're looking to see what's going to be the priority, what patient you're going to run to first, which one is most concerning? Whenever you see suddenly or all of a sudden, and then whatever comes after that is a decrease in the patient status, that's your answer, okay? So take a look. It says the client suddenly becomes <gasps> dyspneic, shortness of breath. Can you live without oxygen? Absolutely not. So that's the answer um, actually with transfusion reaction. The patient will be shortness of breath. They may be dyspneic. You may see um, tachycardia. You're gonna see the heart rate exceed 100. Um, tachypnea, you're going to see the respirations increase. Hypotension, you're going to see the blood pressure uh, go down. A uh, patient may uh, start complaining of black, black, start complaining of back pain, right? All of those um, are signs and symptoms of a possible transfusion reaction. Now, the other choices, the urine being dark, the skin being pale and cool, patient experiencing extreme thirst, those are clinical manifestations of hypovolemia. That patient may be, you know, uh, dehydrated, but those are not signs and symptoms of a transfusion reaction. During a routine home visit, a client describes uh, what the nurse believes may be symptoms related to GERD. The home care nurse updates the plan of care, including nursing interventions related to what symptoms that accompany GERD. GERD is a gastroesophageal reflux disease. Here are our choices, vomiting, nausea, anorexia, or heartburn. 
And the correct answer is four, heartburn. What happens is, and there may be different reasons. It, it may be that the cardiac sphincter is, um, the pressure's too low, it's not tight. It may be there's a weakness in the diaphragm and so a, a part of the stomach is pushing up towards the, um, uh, the esophagus. It could be several reasons why this happens, but regardless of the reason, what happens is um, reflux, the stomach contents, the hydrochloric acid that's supposed to stay in the stomach, it creeps up into the esophagus. The lining of the esophagus was not made to handle gastric acid and so it causes that burning sensation that the patient experiences so heartburn four is the correct answer choice choices one two and three are not associated with GERD four absolutely is what nursing instruction is most helpful for providing some relief from the symptoms accompanying GERD is it one eat three well-balanced meals a day two eat foods that are easy to swallow three avoid lying down after eating or four, clear, uh, drink clear liquids at room temperature. And the correct answer is three, avoid lying down after eating. So I just explained to you about the reflex, right? So does it make sense if somebody's experiencing reflex, why would right after they eat, they lie down? So all of the gastric um, contents can creep up into the esophagus? No, you want gravity to help you, right? So you want the patient to sit up so hopefully that um, the gastric contents can stay in the stomach where they belong. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. One, eat three well-balanced meals. Let me tell you something. Whenever it comes to GI issue, it's always small, frequent meals. You always want your patient to eat small, but frequent meals, not three large meals. So that's wrong. Two, eat foods that are easy um, to swallow. Swallowing is not the problem. The problem is reflux. How are we going to help prevent the reflux? Eating foods that are easy to swallow is not going to help prevent reflux. And then choice four, drink clear liquids at room temperature. That does not solve the problems. The problem, um, drinking at uh, drinks at room temperature, that's not going to help decrease the chances of reflux. But um, avoiding lying down after eating, that absolutely will help decrease the chances of reflux from happening. What modification in the client's position is most appropriate for the nurse to recommend at this time? And you guys should all get this question right. Is it one, have the client remain supine on a mattress that contains a bed board? Two, advise the client to sleep on the water bed temporarily. Three, tell the client to elevate the legs on pillows when retiring at night. Or four, have the client raise the head of the bed on four inch blocks. And the correct answer is four. We want the head of bed elevated and I already explained to you why. Choices one, two, and three is not going to help relieve those symptoms of reflux. A 75 year old client with metastatic cancer of the esophagus is undergoing palliative treatment that includes total parental nutrition, TPN, administered through a central subclavian catheter. What nursing assessment is essential in, for evaluating the client's response to TPN? Is it one, test your specific gravity, two, monitor the capillary blood glucose, three, measure the arterial pulse pressure, or four, obtain an apical radial pulse pressure? And guys, the correct answer is to monitor the capillary blood glucose level. So let me tell you something about TPN. It is very, very, very high in glucose. So TPN, total parental nutrition, this is something that when we need to get food, we need to get nutrients into a patient's body, but we need to bypass the GI tract, we need to bypass the gastric system, we'll give them TPN. But TPN has a very high concentration of glucose. So most patients who get TPN, we've all, we also have to give them ins insulin to help keep that glucose down. So that is the correct answer. Choices one, uh, three, and four, none of them are specific to TPN, but high glucose absolutely is. And that's why number two is the correct answer choice. What finding documented in the client's chart is the administration, I'm sorry, I have to start over. What finding documented in the client's chart is the best evidence that the client is responding favorably to the administration of TPN? Is it one, the client's electrolytes are in balance, two, the client's gaining weight, three, the client's appetite is returning, or four, the client is voiding clear yellow urine? And the correct answer is two. 
the client's gaining weight? Go back to the question. This patient has med metastatic cancer esophagus, so it's already spread, and they're getting palliative treatment. So this is not a, a treatment trying to cure, okay? They're getting palliative treatment, and so we're giving them TPN. We're trying to get nutrients in their body. How do we know it's effective? They're gaining weight. We're not giving the TPN for the electrolytes. Of course, when we give the patient um, the TPN, we're going to be checking the labs. We want to make the electrolyte, make sure the electrolytes are in balance, but that's not the purpose, right? We're not giving it to make their appetite return, and we're not giving it um, for the urine. We want to see that patient gain weight. We're giving that TPN to get the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients in their body. Next question. What nursing actions are most appropriate? Oh, let me go back. While the tube feeding formula is infusing, the client tells the nurse about feeling full and nauseated. What nursing actions are most appropriate at this time? Select all that applies. All right, guys, how do we treat select all that applies? We treat them as true or false. Individually, if it answers your question, it's true. And if it doesn't, you throw it out, it's false. So our patient's getting tube feeding infusion and now they're complaining, now they're stating that they're feeling full and nauseated. What's the most appropriate response? One, measure the stomach residual, true or false? False. We were supposed to measure the stomach residual before we even started the tube feeding. So now that the tube feeding's already infused and they're saying they're feeling full and nauseated, no, that's not when you do it, so that's false. How about two, administer an anti-emetic by gastrostomy tube? False. You're not resolving the problem. The problem of them feeling nauseated, what do you think is happening from too much fluid. That's why they're feeling so full, right? So no, you're not going to be giving them an anti-medic. And I know some of you guys who chose the anti-medic, you chose that because of the nausea, but you have to be able to think critically. Look at the big picture. Okay. Yeah, they're nauseous, but why? So you're going to give them an anti-medic while this is still infusing. You're not fixing the problem. False. Three, stop the infusion temporarily. True. Why? Because the problem is that they're getting too much fluid. They may be getting it too fast. Whenever something's harming, they're injuring your patient. The first thing you're going to do is stop what's harming them. So that's true. How about four? Add water to dilute the formula. False. You're going to make it worse. They already have too much fluid going in and you're adding to it. False. Five. Turn the client on to the right side. True. You're going to turn off what's offending them, what's hurting them, right? And after you do that, you're going to turn that patient to the left side because you want to increase, you know, that gastric emptying. There's too much. You want to decrease it. So that's true. Six, request an order for a different type of formula. False. You may do that in a day or two after you've monitored your patient. Maybe that formula is not working for the patient and then you're going to request it, but it's too soon. So the correct answer, guys, is choice number three and choice number five. After the tube feeding formula has infused, what action should the nurse taste, take next? One, place the client on the left side. Two, lower the head of the bed. Three, clamp the opening of the G-tube. Or four, instill several ounces of plain tap water down the tube. And the correct answer is four. After uh, the infusion's complete, you're gonna do what? Flush again, you flush before and you flush after. And the choice four is the correct answer. Now, choice number one, place them on um, the left side. After the infusion, you're gonna wanna turn the head to the left side because in any, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Any salivation that they may have, you want to decrease the risk of aspiration. So you're going to turn the head to the left side. Choice two, lower the head of the bed. Of course not. Um, you're going to keep the head of the bed um, elevated. We want to prevent aspiration. Choice four, clamp the opening of the G-tube. Yes, you may do that, but that's after you flush the line. So the correct answer is four. When the nurse... When the nurse cares for the client receiving a gastric tube feedings, what is a common cause for the development of diarrhea? Is it one, air in the um, gastrointestinal tract, two, incorrect tube location, three, fiber-rich formula, or four, highly concentrated formula? 
and guys, the correct answer is four. That highly concentrated formula, that's what causes the diarrhea that many patients who are on these type of food, uh, feedings um, get diarrhea from. Choice number one, air in the gastrointestinal tract, that will cause the gas. Choice two, incorrect tube location, that will cause reflux. And then choice three, high, um, excuse me, fiber rich formula, that actually will, can help promote like a, nor, a more normal bowel elimination versus it be, be watery and diarrhea like, right? But when we're talking about diarrhea, it's because of that very high concentration of the solution. So four is the correct answer choice. What nursing action is best for preventing bacterial contamination of tube feeding formula? One, wipe the tube's exit site with an antiseptic swab. Two, perform hand washing before bathing the client. Three, wear gloves at all times when providing care. Or four, change a formula bag and tubing every day. And the correct answer is four. The question is, what's the best thing to prevent bacterial contamination of what? The tube feeding. So it makes sense to change that tube every day to not allow time for bacteria to grow. Look at the wrong answer choices. One, wiping the tube's exit site with antiseptic soap. First of all, we don't do that. That's not protocol. And number two, okay, you're gonna wipe the exit site so it's okay for the bacteria to be up in there but it just can't leave because you wiped the exit site. That makes absolutely no sense. That's false. Choice two, perform hand washing before bathing um, a patient. You always wanna perform hand washing before and after care for a patient. Hand washing is the number one way to uh, prevent the transmission of bacteria from one person to another. But this question is not asking about that. The question is asking about bacteria, specifically um, cont contamination of the tube feeding formula. So washing your hands before bathing the patient, what does that have to do with the formula or the, um, the tube? So that's false. And then three, wearing gloves at, what's that word? All, always, never, only, every, stay away from those all-inclusive words. When you see those all-inclusive words in your answer choice, do not choose that unless you know for a fact that's your answer. And guess what? Usually that is never the answer. Don't choose it, right? Look at what it says, wearing gloves at all times. First of all, you wear gloves when you expect to come into contact with bodily fluids such as blood, you know, saliva, uh, um, urine. You don't wear gloves at all time. That's number one. And number two, what does wearing gloves at all time have to do with the contamination of the tube feeding or the formula? And um, last is our correct answer choice. Of course, changing the bag and the tubing every day. Again, you're not allowing time for that bacteria to grow. The client with the gastrostomy is silent and withdrawn as the nurse cares for the insertion site. What nursing statement is most appropriate for encouraging the client's expression of feelings? One, are you depressed? Two, it must be tough for you. Three, this may get better soon. Or four, lots of people eat this way. And guys, the correct answer is it must be tough for you. Make a simple observation while validating their feelings. You make that you make that observation and then you don't say anything and allow them a chance to reflect on what you just said and then respond. Look at the wrong answer choices. One, are you depressed? That's a closed-ended question. We don't ask closed-ended questions unless, you know, we're asking about abuse, we're asking about suicide, or we're doing a quick assessment, right? Other than that, we're asking open-ended questions to facilitate communication, a uh, therapeutic communication. Choices, choice three, this may get better soon. Okay, there are two problems with this answer choice. Number one, that word may, stay away from gray areas that are answers like may, might, maybe, possibly. If you don't know what the answer is, don't choose that. Don't choose that. Why? Because NCLEX is back, black and white. It's a perfect world, right? So we're not going to choose that unless we know for a fact that that's the answer. And that's not the answer. That's number one. The second problem I have with this answer is when you say it might get better soon, you're offering false reassurance. Do we ever offer false reassurance in nursing? Never. You stay away from that. That is not therapeutic communication. Last, lots of people eat this way. You are, um, um, you are minimizing their situation 
You think they care if lots of people are in that same situation? No, this is happening to them. And so you do not diminish or minimize their feelings or what's happening to them. Choice number uh, two is the correct answer. All right, guys, we're down to our last question. The client's being discharged. What nursing instruction is best to provide the family if the gastrostomy tube becomes obstructed? One, irrigate the tube with peroxide. Two, instill tap water with a syringe. Three, melt the gastrostomy tube. Or four, apply suction to the gastrostomy tube. And the correct answer is two, you're going to flush, guys. You're going to instill tap water with a syringe. You're going to teach that patient how to do that. Wrong answer choice is one, irrigate peroxide. You know that's wrong. Choice number three, milk the gastrostomy tube. Um, you can do that, but it's usually ineffective. What is effective is actually flushing the tube. And then four, apply suction to the gastrostomy tube. You never, ever, 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 ever apply suction. So that's false. Choice number two is a correct answer. And I forgot to mention this at the beginning of the video, but this is a video for the LP and LVN student. But it's also helpful to the RN student because these are basic concepts that you absolutely must understand to build on top of. So guys, um, this is the end of the video. Please let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section. Let me know um, if you'd like me to explore these concepts further and go over uh, more concepts. And if you do, in what format? A format like this, question and answer. Would you like it in Kahoot format? Or would you like it in a lecture format where I'm teaching out of a book? Please let me know in the comment section. Sound off. Don't forget, I'm offering Next Generation and Clex Reviews, one-on-one -on -one tutoring and consultation sessions. I book very quickly. So be sure to go to my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com and reserve your spot right now. And while you're there, be sure to check out the audio lessons that I have available. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my other social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So please be sure to check me out there as well. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. You guys will catch me on the next video.